Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Marcus Stewart and welcome to Call It In The Ring. We are talking about Monday Night Raw, September 24th, 2018, live in Denver, Colorado. How you doing everybody? It's great to see you once again. And by see you, I mean I, I close my eyes and I imagine you gathered around the, uh, the fireplace listening to me. It's kind of like uh, Franklin uh, Roosevelt's old fireside chats. We're having a good old-fashioned fireside. Uh, just, you know, get together. Like, just gather around. Everybody get in real close. Because we're going to just, you know, cuddle up to some wrestling. I can't think of a better thing to, to spend a uh, chilly autumn evening with. The wrestling. And then maybe secondary my voice. And as always, a reminder that you can all you can listen to this show on a variety of platforms. Uh, you can find it on I, uh, iTunes at Marcus Writes About Games. You can also find it on Podbean at the same name, or you can listen to it on YouTube. Same name once again, Marcus Writes About Games. So now you have a myriad of ways to um, enjoy the show around whatever fire that you decide to start, whether it be a, uh, a fireplace, a campfire, an accidental uh, home fire, uh, I would recommend calling the fire department if, the, uh, if that last one happens, um, rather than listen to me talk about wrestling, but I'm also not here to tell you how to live your life. Anyways, on with the show. So, uh, before, at the very beginning of the show, it's worth pointing out that there's a new signature, a new opening signature, and if you don't know what that is, that's the, um, uh, right before the, uh, I guess the theme song, even though Raw doesn't really have a theme song anymore, which is kind of sad, but the, uh, the thin now, the thin now forever thing that they always have, you know, it's different, they got a new one, it still says thin now forever, but it's, uh, fancier looking looks good um kind of over maybe overdue it's been if i remember correctly and this shows how big of a nerd that i am um that that last signature the old then now forever um debuted either at raw 1000 or the week after raw 1000 but it was around it was this time the same time that the show first went three hours so this was back in 2012 so that last signature has been around for six years now um, I don't, maybe, is that the longest time that the signatures have, uh, has lasted? Because, you know, there's been different ones over the years. Um, I don't know. Someone let me know that has more time than I do to tell me that. <laughs> Anyways, the real show kicks off with, uh, Baron Corbin backstage. And he's waiting in the parking lot. And Stephanie McMahon and Triple H arrive in a limo. And Steph... Uh, you know, is in her, uh, I'm gonna be Stephanie McMahon and, and ruin someone's life night. Uh, Baron tries to sing happy birthday. Apparently it's Stephanie's birthday, uh, that night. Happy birthday, Stephanie, I guess. And he's singing happy birthday and Steph is not having any of it. Uh, Triple H leaves because he can tell that, um, some masculinity and, and balls are about to be swiped. And that's exactly what happened. Steph dresses him down immediately uh, for his uh, decision to book himself into a Universal Championship match the week before. And just kind of gives him the old uh, angry parent talking down to the child thing that Stephanie is unfortunately um, way too good at. I mean, I guess she's a parent herself. Um, but just kind of rips on him for not controlling the shield and says, you know what, tonight... You're going to be in a, a six-man tag against the Shield. You need to find two partners, and you need to get your business done. Because if you don't, then Kurt Angle might be back from his vacation sooner than you realize. And, uh, yeah, this is this was every Stephanie just completely um, owning a, a talent that we've seen since the authority, uh, since the birth of the authority five years ago. Man, it's been five years since that started. Um, and yeah, it's still not any more enjoyable to watch. Even someone like, uh, it's even more, I don't know if it's better or worse when she does it to a heel. Because on one hand, you say like, oh, at least the heel is getting what, what the heel deserves. In this case, Baron Corbin, who's been running rampant with his power and just abusing it left and right. 
So you're, it might be like, yeah, now he's finally getting his. But at the same time, there's, uh, it still bugs me, and it's always bugged me about Stephanie, the way she just completely emasculates the talent, um, man or woman, and kind of uh, positions herself as the untouchable, like, heel boss. Uh, I don't know, there's something just self-serving about it and i don't know you know i don't know if that's what she if that's her her mindset of oh i'm gonna make myself look great but that's how it comes off as and someone like corbin who i don't know it just makes them look lesser it doesn't make them look like this um dominant heel f like force or whatever like she may as well have found mcintyre and ziggler and Braun and just ripped on them and then they, I think what makes it worse is that the, at least the guys, they never get a chance to, um, to come back from it or respond or retaliate. They just kind of have to take it. The only superstar actually that's been getting consistently won over on Stephanie, and this is very recent, is Ronda Rousey. So that's been refreshing to watch. But yeah, it, this was the Stephanie, um, you know, adding Corbin's uh, soul to her her vast collection. We go to the ring and the shield comes out. And they talk about how they're the uh, the workhorses of WWE, as they've said before. And they hype up that Australia show. And it just occurred to me that that Australia match at the Super Show with the Shield taking on uh, Braun and Ziggler and Drew has all of the titles on Raw in that one match. Like, the all of the male titles. Which is maybe not great. Because that means there can't be... A universal championship match there can't be an icy title match and there can't be a tag title match because the the that one match has monopolized all of the belts so i was like wow i didn't that didn't occur to me till i just kind of saw the graphic and it just i really looked at it and i was like oh man like so what are they gonna what are the other matches gonna be on the raw side um you can't have any title defenses outside of the women's championship that's kind of lame um so yeah, that, that, that's a problem. And the Shield talk about that match, just kind of hyping it up. And um, eventually, Drew McIntyre, Dolph Ziggler, and Braun Str uh, Strowman, or they come out after Corbin. Corbin comes out first and is like, hey, you know, everyone hates you guys. I'm going to be able to find a, par a partner, no problem. But first, these guys have something to say. And that brings out the, uh, the trio, the, the dogs of war, whatever you want to call them. Uh, Drew McIntyre has a really cool coat. I don't know if it's a new coat or if he's worn it that particular coat recently, but it's only now dawned on me. It was as he was on stage. It's like, hey, that that coat's uh, it's pretty sweet, nice coat. Um, they uh, then start talking about Dean Ambrose. They single him out, and they try to basically manipulate the shield and try to cause um, some division with them saying like, oh, we can already see the cracks in you guys. And they're talking about, hey, Dean, why is it that Seth and Roman have championships and you're the one that has to keep kind of bailing them out of stuff since you came back, but you got nothing out of it. And this goes on for a while with all three of them kind of taking turns saying these things like Dolph saying like, it was only two years ago that you were WWE champion on SmackDown and you and I were battling for that for that title and i saw the fire in your eyes and you you've done all this amazing stuff on your own and look like seth needed you to come back and you know you had to help him to to get the title from me the ic title and you got nothing and then you had to help roman to keep his title and you got nothing out of it what's the deal and the whole time ambrose has this really good kind of angry poker face where he's not showing any real reaction to this but he's you know it could easily be like a like his his seething like you guys are uh idiots and i can't wait to murder you or you guys are absolutely right what the fuck it could go either way and i and he doesn't say a word doing this and and during the whole time occasionally seth or roman would interrupt to try to like defend i guess defend not only dean but defend themselves saying like you know that's bs but you know the villains point out like see they're not even letting you talk <laughs> they, they they just love stealing your you know, your spotlight or whatever. And again, Dean doesn't say a word during this whole promo. He's just kind of, just kind of taking it in, which was nice. And so it's kind of, you know, building that, planting a seed of, of doubt and, and building some mystery. But I love, 
I, I, I still very much love this incarnation of Ambrose, this more serious incarnation. He's not goofy. He's very, very, um, like I said, like he just looks like he could rip your head off at any given moment. Um, and yes, also this high, this, uh, segment, uh, highlighted that there's too many shows happening right now. Too many pay-per-views they're building up to because they mention the Super Show tag team match. And then they also mentioned that, uh, you know, Braun's like, oh, a crown jewel. I'm going to take the title. And I had to remember, I was like, oh yeah, that's right. There's another pay-per-view, another international show in the near future where there's going to be a title match, like the triple threat between him, Braun, or Braun, Roman, and, and Brock. And, you know, talking about that in the same breath as the Australia show is really confusing because you're just, there's too many shows happening right now between the those two and Evolution. You're like, oh, okay, so yeah, this storyline, they're going to fight a match here, but then later on they're going to fight at this other show. And it's just so weird to have, to be building towards si so many shows simultaneously. It just, it's hard to keep focus of, and I really can't wait till we get through this, this patch of, um, of just network specials and stuff just to uh to get to get the the show just back on on a singular focus this brings us to our first match we got finn balor accompanied by bailey who is his mixed match uh challenge partner taking on jinder mahal who is accompanied by of course Sunil singh as well as alicia fox who is his mixed match challenge partner um and this match was you know whatever um, it's, uh, Jinder Mahal has officially become the, the new Jack Swagger or Great Kali in terms of the guy that was rushed to the world title. And then once they lost it, they immediately fell through the floor. And now he's the jobber that when they wrestle, they'll mention like former WWE champion. And it just sounds super like wrong because you're like how this guy who is nothing and loses all these matches. He like, Mahal doesn't even get an entrance. And you're like, he was the WWE champion? And you're like, yeah, it's crazy, right? At one point, Michael Cole says that Mahal has all the tools. Which, again, and then Corey kind of immediately says, well, like, well, yeah, he's proven it. He was WWE champion. And, like, that's that one line kind of sums up what I just said of, like, he has this, uh, just the idea of, like, having to mention that, like, Mahal has all the tools to, because usually you follow that up with, to make it to the top or to become a world champion, be like, uh, he already did that and he held it for like half a year. Um, so he has all the tools to get to get back there, or I mean, you know, that that could work, but it just that's reserved for someone that's never gotten there. You're like, oh Mahal already did that though. Um, but that's how far he's kind of fallen here. Um The match ends when uh, uh Alicia Fox tries to interfere and distract Balor, which then uh Bailey decides to uh to one up her and do the same and interfere to distract Mahal, which got a huge pop. And notice how every time Bailey does anything remotely um and not even necessarily heelish, but anything that has some edge, the people love it. They yeah. love seeing Bailey um do do, you know, kind of dance on the darker side a bit or just show some attitude and people love this. I it's very rare to see a pop for something as basic as like a just a really simple distraction. But her distraction allows Finn to roll up Mahal for the one, two, three. Um, Finn Balor, man, he needs something to do that's not random match because he's he's kind of back to his uh, his standard pattern of just kind of being there and just having matches. And I think I said this last week, but Finn is probably pretty easily the most popular uh, babyface that isn't a Shield member. So... Given that the entire show is built around the S.H.I.E.L.D. versus uh, Dogs of War storyline, there's not much else to really get invested in that, at least on the kind of the male side. So, like, I feel like right now this would be the perfect time to be pushing Balor towards something. But unfortunately, both of the singles male's titles are in the S.H.I.E.L.D. and the S.H.I.E.L.D.'s tied up with this tag faction feud. So Finn kind of has nothing to chase right now, but man, like he, this would be a perfect time to be kind of just elevating him. See, if nothing else, offer another kind of big baby face alternative. Like, oh yeah, Finn Balor, he's doing something really cool right now. Um, but yeah, he's kind of back to just having matches and just kind of being there, which is uh, unfortunate. 
You know what's uh, a little bit less unfortunate is uh, the Riot Squad taking on the uh, Natalia and the Bella Twins. Um, this was a whatever match. The only uh, highlight, and I say that in quotations because it's not really a good thing, is that Liv Morgan uh, got hurt somehow where, uh, by Brie Bella, which, damn it, man, Brie is not having a, not having the best comeback in terms of her in-ring work because, especially on Raw, it seems like when she does things on SmackDown, everything is relatively okay on Raw, not so much, where she uh, was in the match with Liv, she does her, the yes kicks, you know, made famous by her husband, or if you listen to Corey Graves, made famous by The Miz, and the kicks from what I saw looked fine, um, but apparently she must have kicked the crap out of Liz, it's, or Liv, I'm sorry, at some point, because Liv after that is kind of taken to the floor and she's being checked on by trainers. And Cole at, Cole at one point said that she was taken to the back. But after the match, because the Riot Squad won, we clearly see Liv still on the floor. Like, she's over in the corner where the, uh, the, the, like, JoJo and the, the bell ringer is. And, she, but she's being tended to by two trainers. And they kind of, like, as, as soon as the Riot Squad win, they kind of go out there to go check on her, her buddy, their crazy buddy. Um, so I hope she's okay. I don't know what, what happened there, but yeah, that was kind of the only thing of note to mention in this match. Uh, Brie Bella's wrestling is still a, uh, still a problem. Uh, Nikki, not, not so much. Uh, next we get a really long, uh, presentation for the, the Connor's Cure thing, because, you know, it's the end of the month, so this is kind of the, uh, the end of it. Uh, the entire roster's on the stage. And Triple H and Stephanie are in the ring. They have this uh, uh this blanket over what's clearly uh some some championship belt, and they go through kind of the whole month about uh, raising PD uh money for pediatric cancer. They they announce a partnership with Hyundai, who uh had they show a video of like a car that had these handprints from these um these real life um you know cancer uh, victims, and you know it was. It was long, and, you know, I know a lot of fans kind of uh, roll their eyes at this stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's where you can fast forward through it if you don't want to see it, uh, uh, assuming that you uh, DVR'd the, the show. Um, it's probably that, that car with the uh, the handprints is probably the first car in WWE history that, that rolled out on the stage and was not destroyed in some manner. Um, Brock Lesnar should have came out and maybe ripped the door off and threw it into the crowd. Um... But yeah, these two kids that, uh, I, I don't want to say necessarily, I don't think they won, quote, a thing, because it sounds weird to win a charity. Um, it's like, hey, you won with your um, debilitating illness. Um, but these uh, this guy, a little kid, a boy and a girl, they, they get um, a universal and women's championship. Uh, this Hunt the Hyundai representative gives the $200,000 check for the, 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 the cure, the... Uh, the uh, charity apparently they raised over two million dollars and yeah just a big old thing um you know nothing nothing bad about that at all the only weird thing that's always been weird is stephanie mcmahon being a heel on tv and then immediately in the same show is like the biggest kind of baby face around when it comes to the charity stuff but you know that's kind of just where we are at this point Backstage, Dolph Ziggler comes up to Ambrose, and Ambrose immediately is about to punch him right in the face. And Dolph's like, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! Let's just let's just talk. Let's just talk, man. Let's just, you know settle down." And he start he pretty much reiterates what they were saying before about Ambrose uh, being underappreciated. And he also mentioned, he you know he said like, "Hey, you know when you were injured, did you even hear from your dudes? Did they even keep up with you to see if you're all right?" And then he mentions that Dean had a staff infection, which I was not aware of. But apparently at some point when he was hurt, he had a staph infection, um, which is, that's, that's dangerous. Uh, that could be deadly. Uh, obviously a good thing that he did not die or anything from that. Um, but I, I was not privy to that part of his uh, injury. And he mentions that, hey, you know, I'm just saying that tonight in, you know, in your tag match, we're going to be watching and, you know, just give the signal. And you don't have to do anything. Just give us the signal, and we'll take care of the rest. So, like, basically saying, like, you can join us, and we'll, we'll hook you up, man. We'll hook you up. Uh, again, outside of threatening to murder Dolph in the beginning, Dean doesn't really say anything here. He just kind of uh, just kind of d- takes it in. 
our next match is Chad Gable taking on Connor of the Ascension. Uh, we get a little inset promo where Gable asks, his new motto for life is that basically, what would Bobby Roode do? He has uh, basically become a Bobby Roode fanboy, which um, of all the, the incarnations of Bobby Roode that you could be a fanboy of, this is not the one that I would choose. <laughs> um, Babyface, really goofy and dorky Bobby Roode, which I never thought I would ever call Bobby Roode dorky, but that is exactly what his Babyface character is, is the giant dork with a robe, which uh, saddens me. Uh, the Ascension get an entrance. They First, they come out second, which is like, whoa. And then we see their entrance, which is really rare because it's the damn Ascension. And you you kind of remember like, man, the Ascension have really sweet music. If you really don't ever get to hear that much. And this was a, uh, a whatever match. Uh, at one point in the beginning, Connor whips uh, Gable into the corner. And Gable does a hard kind of front buckle, almost like very Bret Hart ish like if you remember Bret Hart when he wrestled he used to take those uh those turnbuckle whips like face first into the turnbuckle and just nail that turnbuckle with his chest Gable was like doing his best uh imitation of that it, was, it looked pretty good and maybe in the craziest thing of the night and maybe the craziest thing of the week freaking Connor won the Ascension won something on Raw which <laughs> as soon as Connor picked up the win uh, and a clean win of that, uh, Cole just says, like, the crowd is stunned in the silence, which it kind of was, and I think because it's the same thing that everyone's thinking of, like, wait, the Ascension won something on Raw? Like, holy crap, like, that's, what bizarre land are we in? Like, I don't even know how to react to this. I don't even think the Ascension know how to react to it. They're, they're, like, oh, crap, we won. Uh, but yeah, uh, this, uh, sure... I just mean that this weird kind of barely a story story is going to keep happening. Does next week, does Gable wrestle Victor or does Bobby fight Victor next week? Who knows? But holy crap, the Ascension won something. Um, I don't buy for a second that this is going to lead to any, any sort of real meaningful change for these guys because they the ship sailed on them um, seemingly a long time ago. But yeah, never, never forget this day. Years from now, you'll be asked, people will be asking, where were you? When Connor picked up a big win on Raw over Chad Gable. Speaking of where people are, Triple H and Stephanie are in the parking lot. They're about to leave when Charlie Caruso comes up to Triple H and asks him about what Undertaker said the the prior week about um, Triple H not having a soul anymore and how he's delusional. And Triple H points out that he sold his soul a long time ago and that Undertaker shouldn't be worried about a suit because if that is the case, then he's already lost. And just says that Taker's end is near. Our next match is the Raw Tag Team Championships. We've got uh, Duke. Duke? Did I say Duke? Oh my god. I don't even know who Duke is. Duke. <laughs> but we have Dolph. Sounds nothing like Duke. Dolph Ziggler and Drew McIntyre taking on the Revival. If you remember, this is kind of fallout from when uh, D&D won the championships in the first place because it was supposed to be the B team, the former champs, defending against the Revival. But then uh, McIntyre and Ziggler beat the crap out of the Revival and inserted themselves into the match. And that's how they won the titles. So this is the Revival getting their revenge. And holy crap, this was a really good match. And a perfect showcase or reminder that the Revival are really great at tag team wrestling. If you, this might have been the first time since, at least in this particular stretch of their main roster careers, um, barring the, the two other kind of starts that they had before both of them got hurt, that these guys got to show off why they were so revered and awesome in NXT, where they were dominating a lot of this match, especially in the first half. Like, they, Dolph was started the match, and he, they kept him in the match for a majority of it where they were just wrestling super smart. They were cutting the ring in half. They targeted Dolph's arm and they kept, you know, quick tags and just doing all these things to Dolph's arm and just torturing him, which makes sense. One, because that's just, you know, wrestling. That's just how you win matches. And also they were upset because, you know, they, they're pissed at these guys for what they did uh, a couple weeks back. So they're, they're out to hurt them. So they're just being vicious on Dolph. And the crowd is slowly starts to get behind you, um, the Revival because they're so good. They are just cutting off 
Ziggler and McIntyre at every pass. And it was just a really smart match in terms of just how it was wrestled. Um, the only time, like, Dolph finally gets a breather is that they fight outside. And then uh, Dash Wilder misses a, a charge and is sent into the stairs. And then that allows Drew, who has just been desperately watching Dolph just get picked apart, comes in. But even then, his you would think he would come in and just kind of destroy both of them. But it doesn't last long. They like they use their double team stuff to cut Drew off. And I was really entertained with just how this match was going in terms of like it didn't go the way you would expect. Um, at one point, like Drew's outside the ring and he tries to chop. I, I forget which one it was, but he, they, I think it was uh, Scott, but Scott ducks and he chops the, the ring post, which that looked painful. And uh, yeah, like just working as a complete unit. And this was so like, I was a huge fan of the revival in NXT. Like if you've never watched, if you're only a main roster fan and you aren't totally sure why the revival kind of gets the hype that it has because they haven't really had a chance to show off why they're so great on the main roster because they kind of had, had their bread and butter in NXT because they had long tag team matches where they were, you know, the perfect kind of bastard heels where they were just like use every old school heel tactic in the book to keep the advantage of the other teams. And they knew how to like isolate an opponent and a body part and they were so good at it and they had so like great opponents to uh to work with like if you want to see some of the best tag team wrestling in not even just wb but really probably in all of wrestling in my opinion just i'd say look up their matches against american alpha and especially look up their matches against diy and next heat because holy crap it is some tag team excellence and we got to see a bit of that here, and the crowd got really into it by towards the end of it. You know, they got a "This is Awesome" chant. Um, the unfortunately, the titles did not change hands. Uh, McIntyre and, and Dolph managed to uh, to pull together enough to hit their zigzag claymore combo and barely, just barely, eke out a win. But they looked like they had been in a war, and Revival looked awesome in this match. And I hope that. Uh, this is the start of them, if nothing else, just getting more time on Raw to have these kind of matches because they can they can be kind of like the Seth Rollins of the tag division where they are they are kind of workhorses and can work with just about anyone, in my opinion. So I was really, really happy and pleasantly surprised with how uh, well this match went. Another thing that written really well was uh, Elias and uh, Kevin Owens. Like We get the Kevin Owens show. And Elias is uh, with him to kind of be his opener, kind of like a talk show where like he's the he's the the band, and uh, you know Elias does this big introduction for him, and then Kevin comes out, and they have a very entertaining just kind of com just camaraderie, which is, um, you know, like Kevin Owens playing the talk show host, and Elias is the uh, sitting in his stool next to him at his table, and it's just kind of like they're just kind of playing off each other, and. I would love to see more of this in the in the future of these two because they're two of the most charismatic and just straight up funny guys on on the show. And they hype up the the Super Showdown match because they're going to be teaming up to take on Bobby Lashley and John Cena. Of course, these two rip on both of them with Kevin reminding us that he beat Cena in his first night in the company. And then they bring out their guest, Mr. Leo Rush, two hundred five Lives Leo Rush, who is now the hype man. And that's what they call him, the hype man, not a manager, the hype man for Bobby Lashley. And they, they, they uh, you know, Leo comes out and he does his, uh, his, uh, his hyping of Lashley. Like, well, let me tell you, let me tell you about Bobby Lashley, my man, Bobby Lashley. He is like, I'm the, and you know, I'm the 23 year old that's solid gold or whatever. I'm trying to do Leo's voice. Leo has a, again, Leo can talk. He has a voice that is distinctive and borderline annoying, but my God, does it, you can't say it doesn't grab your attention. Like he is easily one of the most memorable and kind of brightest personalities on the show, which is a fantastic thing for him. Um, the uh, Elias and, and Kevin do a funny bit where they're like, Hey, you know, come out to the ring. We even got a chair for you. And then Kevin pulls out a booster seat and puts it on the chair. So like, we, we got it. Got you all set up, buddy. Of course, um, Leo says that he is not naive because, you know, he's not an idiot. He's not going to go down there because he's just going to get beat up probably. And brings out his uh, his man, my man, Bobby Lashley. Bobby Lashley. Let me tell you about Bobby Lashley. 
And uh, we get our match, uh, Elias taking on Lashley. And this match went on longer than I expected and probably too long. It actually got like two segments. And uh, Lashley won. And then during, uh, by DQ, because during late, late in the match, Kevin decides that he'd like to um, eviscerate Leo Rush and starts chasing him around the ring. Of course, Leo being uh, Spider-Man is uh, dodging him. And then eventually, he, uh, Lashley and Elias, are they, they battle outside. And then as Kevin goes to hit Leo, he kind of dodges and he accidentally hits Lashley, which draws an unintentional DQ. Uh, Post-match, uh, the, the villain tried to go after Leo again, but he's doing his um, flipping and dodging all over the place. But then eventually he gets caught. Um, Kevin's about to powerbomb him, but Lashley saves him and dispatches of the, uh, the bad guys. And Lashley and Rush stands Hall. Again, I... I'm feeling this pairing of, of Lashley and, and Leo. Leo is a hell of a mouthpiece in, in the short time he's been on, on Raw. And um, I'm curious to see where these two go. Backstage, we see Seth Rollins. He comes up to Drew McIntyre. Drew's just chilling out, drinking his, uh, his water, his uh, Scottish Avion, or whatever it is. And he kind of flips the table saying that, hey, you know, you, you guys are talking about how we're using, you know, me and Roman are just using Dean, which is not true. But maybe you should look in the mirror because the only one being used here is you, Drew. He's like, and he kind of brings up, you know, like, first of all, Braun doesn't give a crap about you. And also Dolph clearly is the weak link in your tag team. Uh, he needs you more than you need him. He, like, you literally had to carry him out of Hell in a Cell. And he basically says the things that I and probably a lot of people that really like Drew McIntyre are thinking of, like, yeah, you're, Drew, Dolph is riding your coattails, dude. You're way better than this. You know, you could be a star. And, you know, he just kind of says, gives him some food for thought. And then uh, Seth uh, slinks away. And then Dolph comes up and he's like, hey, what was that about? And Drew just says, kind of, dismiss. he's just like, don't worry about it. Just kind of walks away. So you're kind of like thinking about it, but you're like, okay. I again, I'm excited. I can't wait for Drew to be on his own. Next up, we have Nia Jax taking on Alicia Fox. Uh, Ember Moon is in Nia Jax's corner, and uh, Alexa Bliss is in in Alicia's. Who is Alexa's kind of an afterthought here, which is weird to say about Alexa Bliss. Uh, this was a nothing match. This is just kind of a reminder of like, hey, you know, Nia was nominated for a People's Choice Award along with Cena and, and, and one of the Bellas, maybe both. Um, and, you know, quick match. Nia destroys her with a, her Samoa, Samoa drop. And, yeah, not nothing to say about that. Going on. Backstage, again, again, kind of how I mentioned, we see Drew come up to Dean. And, again, like I said about how this story is kind of dominating the show, uh, Drew comes up to Dean now. And Dean is like, what the hell is it now? Which is kind of my reaction to this dude. It's like, oh my God, what now? And Drew says like, hey, your your boy Seth came up to me trying to get in my head. But, you know, why would he do that unless we were right about what we were saying? You know, why would he try to drive a wedge between our our faction if not to deflect attention from the, the clear cracks in yours? And he brings up Seth's past betrayal, saying like, hey, you know, it's not like Seth has ever stabbed you in the back before. Uh, yeah, this is just the, this web of intrigue of people trying to turn other people is a thing that's happening. And it's like, okay, I, I think we get it. I mean, I, I get that, you know, that's kind of the, uh, you know, every show needs like a, a through line. Um, but there's nothing else really than this, like I said before. So if you're not enjoying this, you're kind of out of luck for the most part. Uh, Shawn Michaels is going to be on Raw next week. Always happy to see Shawn, even if he doesn't have a, a hair. <laughs> then we get to our main event. The Shield taking on Baron Corbin and question mark, question mark. Who did Corbin find to join him in his fight against the Shield? I actually had the name written down before he even said it. And I was happy that it was this uh, these two. The AOP, the Authors of Pain. Corbin recruits, which for one is awesome because that's a that is a matchup I've been hoping to see for a while. It's the Authors of Pain interacting with uh, the Shield um, in any whatever combination of the Shield, and also that just like just even in context like in kayfabe story or whatever that just makes sense. Why would you not find two of the most dominant guys 
on the show to take on one of the most dominant factions in history. So Corbin, not, not dumb here, not dumb. Um, and this was a fun match. It was fun to see, um, the shield take on their bigger, meaner, uh, counterparts. You know, do you think they'd be friends? Cause they, they, all five guys have an affinity for kind of like military SWAT fatigue, the looks, um, but yeah, AOP got, didn't get like, they got to show off like they were dominating a lot here, throwing, just throwing Roman and Seth around. And a lot of this match was Roman and Seth wrestling with Dean, um, just on the apron for a lot of it, uh, just, uh, not being tagged in, not like intentionally, but he just wasn't tagged in, but just kind of telling the story of like Dean and Seth stealing the spotlight in, you know, quote unquote, um, but also Seth, uh, gets isolated and like Roman gets taken out outside and then Seth is trying to tag Dean, but he just keeps getting cut off by the, these two monsters, the, the AOP, the AOP, um, Cole kept calling them authors of pain. So maybe the name hasn't completely gone away, which is good. Um, and then eventually, you know, the crowd's just begging for Dean to get in there and Seth manages to, to finally escape and get Dean. And then of course Dean just explodes and just starts going off on everybody. Um, but then, you know, the AOP come back and they, they, they're dominating, but then, uh, Roman and Seth come in and, you know, Superman punches and suicide dives and they're just all over the place. Dean, he eventually gets, uh, Baron alone and hits dirty deeds to get the win. Or actually, no, no, he hits dirty deeds, but then has to dive outside to prevent, uh, one of the authors from coming in. This allows Roman to, to slip back in and as, Corbin kind of gets up from Dirty Deeds, which he got up from Dirty Deeds a bit too quickly, given that it's really um, one of the most protected finishers on the roster. He kind of gets up relatively quick and gets speared down. Um, I think Corbin took all three of their finishers. I believe he got curb stomped too before this, but he gets speared down. Roman gets the win. And then we kind of get a, an interesting little thing where like uh, Seth and Roman are celebrating while Dean is still kind of laying outside after he's still recovering from the suicide dive. And I should, I forgot to point out in the beginning that at the beginning of this match, uh, the dogs of war, Braun, du Drew, and Dolph came out on stage with chairs and they kind of sat and watched this match and they're kind of waiting for the, the, the signal from Dean to, to join them. So after the match, uh, the two champions are in the ring celebrating. Dean kind of makes his way to the, 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 the bottom of the ramp. So he's on the floor in between the ramp and the ring. And uh, the two factions are kind of waiting to see what Dean's move going to be. And Dean's kind of uh, taking a knee and just kind of like seems to be in his uh, own little world. And everyone's wondering what's going to happen here. But then Dean shows his true allegiance. And he rolls back in with the shield and does the, the shield fist bump. And everyone's real happy that Dean is a shield for life. And the villains are like, oh man, you know, we'll get you next time, Gadget. And that ends the show. So, yeah, I appreciate, you know, when a show has a consistent, like, one theme or like a, even like a kind of a one-off self-contained story. I don't really see or i don't expect this ambrose thing to to g become anything more after this show um but it was an interesting idea i i like it but again it's the show needs more than just this this one storyline dominating everything you kind of need um like Zen, like i would like finn balor to be in a meaningful program or you know, other, other guys that have m more actual storylines to, uh, to complement this one. But like I said, it's hard because this, this whole story has all of the titles, like literally the, all of the, all of the titles are in that one story. Like th the women are fine. They have theirs, but everyone else, all the male titles are in this, this one, uh, angle. So if you're not a part of it, you're kind of just waiting around until they're done so that they can uh, disperse and start doing it. So, you know, it was nice to see Revival get their tag title match, but I don't know who challenges uh, Drew and Dolph next because they've already beaten the Shield in for their tag match. I mean, they could obviously just do it again because WWE. But there's no other teams really being built up that could challenge them at the moment. And the same, like, who 
you know, Dolph's already used his rematch for the IC title. Who goes after Seth? And we already know what Roman's future is. But yeah, that's something that needs to be figured out uh, quickly. Because like I said, if you don't like, if you're not into this story, if it's not really lighting your world on fire, that's about it on the male side. So yeah. So that, and also too many shows, like I said at the beginning, just too many shows to be building towards. I have to keep like, the fact that I have to try to remember all the different feuds and remember what show they're mostly attached to is a problem of like, okay, um, these three are feuding because they got a tag match at the Australia show, but also Roman and Braun are still feuding on their own because they got the thing at the, the crown jewel thing. There's also evolution, the woman's pay-per-view and you're like, okay, let me just get this all when, which one's coming first and which one's last. It's yeah, it's, it's a, a bit of a mess and it shows on raw a lot more than it does on SmackDown, so, that, just things need to get ironed out there, but, other than that, uh, you know, what, not a terrible show, but not super duper great either, but that Revival match, go look that up, that was a really pleasant surprise, a nice, uh, maybe the brightest spot outside of, uh, Dean Ambrose, uh, so, Thanks for listening, guys. I will be back tomorrow with my SmackDown Live review. If you want to reach out to me and, and hit me up about uh, wrestling, you can follow me on Twitter at MarcusStewart7. That is the number seven. And until next time, guys, thanks for listening.